It's Pride Month when fetishists march down the street bearing their buttocks and declare their pride in loud voices so as to drown out the excoriating inner whisper of their shame. So, hooray. Today, to kick off the pride, we celebrate a sexual deviance historic achievement in sports at the recent All-Atlantic Regional Track and Field Championships, where a man, pretending to be a woman, outraced the real women for the first time ever, except for all the other times. Now, many people feel that a man pretending to be a woman so he can outrace real women is little more than a grifter protected by a widespread grifter culture, populated by academics and journalists and other sorts of grifters. But in fact, a new scientific study by Dr. Thaddeus Grifter refutes that claim. In the abstract or summary of the study, Dr. Grifter explains the science of transgenderism this way, quote, Think of three playing cards lying face up. Two of them are male jacks and one is a female queen. I turn the cards over and tell you to keep your eye on the queen, then I mix them up and ask you to find the queen. You point to the card you think is the queen, but it turns out to be the jack. That's transgenderism, and now you owe me $20." Unquote. Dr. Grifter expanded on his study in an interview at the Mellondale Correctional Facility for Women, where under the name of Carol Grifter, he is serving a five-year term for raping his cellmate. Dr. Grifter said, quote, like any other mammal, human beings are nothing more than flesh machines that change through evolution, which selects those machines that are best suited for sexual reproduction. This evolutionary process has produced two sexes, which we call men and women, the men for impregnating the women and the women for transforming a clump of cells into a human being by passing it through the magic vagina place and then feeding it with her mammary glands, which is why we're called mammals and also why I just can't keep my hands off those saucy vixens. Now, evolution has worked for thousands of years to produce different men and women's bodies, but that has had absolutely no effect on their brains, which are not part of their bodies, but simply a ghostly emotional presence totally immune to evolution so that emotionally men and women are exactly the same. But if a man should feel emotionally that he is a woman who is emotionally exactly the same, then he becomes a woman because, of course, emotionally, they're very different. Now, once he becomes a woman emotionally, he can wear a dress and a string of pearls, which makes him a woman physically, except for his greater size and strength and, of course, his penis, which comes in very handy once he gets a gander at those fabulous mammaries. Now, scientifically speaking, once the man's emotions, which are exactly the same as a woman's emotions, become more like a woman's emotions, which are totally different, then he changes into a woman who is exactly the same, except for the dress and pearls. And now, if you'll excuse me, I have to get back to my cell. I have a hot date, unquote. Dr. Grifter's work on transgenderism follows his previous work in which he studied climate change by interviewing polar bears on what it felt like to be extinct. After nearly being mauled by an extinct bear, Dr. Grifter changed the focus of his study to the way climate change has increased the number of tornadoes in the last two years from 22 to 6. Dr. Grifter says if this increase should continue at the same pace, the number of tornadoes will rise next year to minus 10, causing a shortage of tornadoes almost as disastrous as the shortage of polar bears, whose population has dwindled over the last few years from 25,000 to 26,500. This means that people sitting around waiting for the next tornado could be severely injured by a swirling cloud of extinct bears. Dr. Grifter concludes that therefore climate change must be addressed, at which point it will be female if it can just find a string of pearls. Trigger warning, I'm Andrew Claven, and this is The Andrew Claven Show. All right. I am back from vacation. I hope some, one or two of you survived the Clavenless vacation. What a great, va I, that was one of the great vacations of my life. It truly was. I was hiking with my wife in the Black Forest of Germany, which of course was made famous in the novel uh, Werewolf Cop. It was a great scene in the Black Forest of Germany and Werewolf Cop. And we just, uh, we hiked, I think, 45 miles over the course of about five or six days. And it was just absolutely beautiful. The people were lovely. The scenery was 
uh, just gorgeous. And uh, it was terrific. And I was off social media for nine days, which I think was like, it was like kicking some kind of evil drug. It was just absolutely wonderful. Came back to the excellent news, and this really is excellent news, that the, da the Daily Wire Plus and Angel Studios are entering a partnership to release a new film called Sound of Hope, the story of Possum Trot. This is going to come out on July 4th. I haven't had a chance to screen it yet, but I will this week, and I will get back to you and talk to you about it. Uh, it's a story of um, a, a small black church in East Texas um, where they adopt a bunch of uh, foster kids and take care of them and what happens then. And I, I really, I just have to pause for just a second before the, we begin the show and just say, you know, a lot of people are accused of saying the quiet part out loud. You know that expression? I, Jeremy Boring, famous God King of the Daily Wire, actually does a lot of uh, loud things quietly. And this is an incredibly important moment. I, it's so much more important than all the bloviating and all the fist pounding, all the angry, you know, rage heroin that people sell online a lot. The, you know, Angel Studios, of course, is famous for doing The Chosen and Sound of Freedom. But what they really have done, which is so important, it's boring, but it's important, is they have overridden the distribution system of Hollywood. And this is huge because I can take a an Amex card out of my wallet and make a good looking movie, but I can't get anybody to see it. And Angel Studios has solved that problem. Daily Wire Plus is joining with them to release this film, A Sound of Hope, The Story of Possum Trot. And this is, you know, this is what makes it, this is what changes things. This is the stuff that really changes things, even though it's not as exciting because it's about distribution and who cares. But, you know, a lot of people make fun. I, I hate to say anything nice about Jeremy because I never hear the end of it. He will never let me live it down if I say anything nice about him. But a lot of people accuse him of being the self-designated God King. They call him, you know, like he calls himself the God King. Untrue. I called him the God King. And what, I did it for two reasons. One was kind of to make fun of him because I could see he was going to become a zillionaire and I didn't want him to become an even bigger SOB than he already was. But also... I did it because I knew that behind the scenes, Prager U, Bill Whittle, Ben Shapiro, you know, these are all talented people in their own right, but he was behind the scenes making them to some degree what they were and bringing them along. And he was just, nobody knew who he was. And I thought it, it would be a good thing if actually he got a little bit of credit for the stuff he does. He should get big credit for this. This is a huge deal. And like I said, I'll watch the film uh, this week and I'll get back to it. I didn't get it until last night when I was fast asleep because I'm still on German time. Clavin Clapbacks, if you want to be a part of the show, it's Clavin with a K, it's Clapbacks with a, also a K, Clavin Clapbacks at dailywire.com. Send us your opinions. If you d disagree with us, we'll mock and uh, probably ignore you and maybe even come to your house and, you know, write things on your walls. But we will read it on the show and we actually like to hear from you no matter what you think, uh, whether it's you agree with us. Uh, or you're wrong. We will look at anything. Clavin Clapbacks, both of the K at dailywire.com. Watch us on Daily Wire Plus for free now. You don't have to subscribe to watch the show, and that way you can avoid the censorship on some of the other unnameable platforms. And uh, we'll have a new interview coming up this week with Nellie Bowles. I, I read her book, The Morning Morning After the Revolution. I read it while I was away. It is an absolutely amazing book. I'll talk a little, about it a little today, and then on Wednesday we will have an interview with Nellie. And then, of course, Leave a comment, and if your comment is racist, if it is in some sense disgusting morally uh, or even just physically disgusting, we'll read it on the air because that's what we do here. Today's comment is from Paul DeCamp. He says, anyone who calls the Trump trial a kangaroo court owes an apology to kangaroos. And <laughs> I, ag I agree with that. That is absolutely true. Uh, today's episode, let us get to today's episode. Hooray for heteronormativity. I got a letter on the Clapbacks uh, line, Cl Clavin Clapbacks at dailywire.com. And he, he he said, I hope you don't read this on the air. And so I'm going to leave his name off it because he sent it to Clapbacks so we can read it, but I don't want to put it, I don't want to embarrass him if that would embarrass him. But I have great respect for what he says. He says, I watch your show every week. I love you and your show and love reading your very gifted son, Spencer, no relation. You both are truly national treasures. So, so far it's just factual, right? I can't imagine the frustration and anguish of having to put up with knuckleheads on the internet saying your son is going to hell. However, when you speak about this issue, you sometimes seem to lump every Christian or ortho trad religious person who believes that homosexual behavior is a sin into a box of judgmental people who pick on the gays and assume they're better. I'm going to ask you that you stop painting with such a broad brush. There are many quiet and loving and respectable people who are not like those knuckleheads 
who deserve your condemnation. There are many of us who believe homosexual behavior is a sin, but are hyper aware of our own sin, even sexual sin. Uh, that is also bad, and we have to address it. Now, I, I want to tell you, I agree with what you're saying, and I have nothing but respect. As I happen to know that Spencer has nothing but respect for people who have a developed uh, sexual theology that includes homosexuality and believing homosexuality is a sin. But as I always say, if you're pointed, when you're talking about sin and you're pointing at somebody else, you're pointed in the wrong direction. And I will be honest and say that I despise, I don't hate, but I despise the people uh, who pick on Spencer. He is a better Christian, a better man, and a better person exponentially than they are. And I know that, but I do know that there are many uh, Christians like the letter writer who feel the same about homosexuality that's a sin, but also understand and respect Spencer and understand his value. And I respect these people utterly, and I know Spencer does. And I want to talk about where I am on that at the end of the show, the final chapter, as I address this Pride Month, which I just think is a, a disgrace. And uh, I've discussed as somebody who has nothing but love and friendship for many, many gay people who have been in my life in various uh, capacities. I have nothing but love and respect for them, but I think this uh, gay pride thing is a disgrace. And I just want to tell the letter writer and all of the people who feel the way you feel that I totally respect what you're saying. I understand it, and I do respect it, and I understand the tradition and all of that. And I will first, before we get to Pride Month, I want to put it all in context with chapter one, the problem is not the problem. Every morning, I take balance of nature fruits and veggies because it's the most convenient way to ensure you get your daily intake of fruits and, yes, veggies. Balance of nature uses an advanced cold vacuum process that encapsulates fruits and vegetables into whole food supplements without sacrificing their natural antioxidants. The capsules are completely void of additives, fillers, extracts, synthetics, pesticides, or added sugar. The only thing in Balance of Nature's fruit and veggie capsules are fruits and veggies. You need nutrients to function at your best each and every day. Balance of Nature helps you do just that. If you want to be like me and be able to hike for 45 miles when you're 132 years old, you need nutrients to function at your best each and every day. Balance of Nature helps you do just that. Go to balanceofnature.com and use promo code CLAVEN for 35% off your first order as a preferred customer. Plus, get a great free bottle of fiber and spice. That's balanceofnature.com, promo code CLAVEN. I know you're thinking, how? Oh, how do I spell CLAVEN? It is K-L-A-V-A-N. Now, I had such a lovely time in Germany, and the Germans were so nice, and their food is so good, and so welcoming. None of them, we were in the country, so none of them spoke a lot of English, but just delightful. I hate to start off by talking about Hitler, but I have been watching this Netflix doc called Hitler and the Nazis, Evil on Trial. And basically, they have all this wonderful colorized footage, which really I hated in move in fictional movies, but nonfiction, uh, it really does bring the, the old films to life. And it's basically this accurate history of the Nazi rise to power and World War II and what was happening. But it has this absolutely despicable commentary by historians, not all of them, but a number of them, comparing Hitler to Trump in pseudo-subtle ways. So talking about how Hitler wanted to make Germany great again, or comparing Hitler's disaffected voters to the disaffected Americans who voted for Trump, or referring to Hitler's vacation home as his mar -a Here's just a, a little montage we put together of the commentary by these historians. Cut to. Hitler claims that his life mission will be to claw back control from the dark forces of history and to make sure that Aryan Germans like Hitler will run the fortunes of Germany and that they will make Germany a great country again. It's a group of people who feel shunned. So if we want to make a contemporary analogy, we can see the sort of forgotten people in America. There is a sense that the system has dealt them a bad hand. It's sort of like Hitler's Mar-a-Lago, if you will. A kind of retreat in the Bavarian Alps. So I'm watching this, you know, and I'm thinking, Hey, I like this game. You know, I want to I want to play this game too. So Hitler and Trump, they're alike. They both hold rallies and they both speak in loud voices. 
Uh, they both try to silence the opposition. Oh, wait, no, that's Biden. Biden silences the opposition. They both arrest their political opponents. No, wait, wait, sorry. That's Biden. Biden arrests his political opponents. Not just Trump, but Roger Stone, Paul Manafort, Rick Gates, Michael Flynn, Steve Bannon, Walt Nauta, who's just an assistant to Trump, Carlos de Oliveira, just the guy, the property manager at Mar-a-Lago. Not to mention peaceful protesters uh, who are against abortion, like a 75-year-old woman they just sentenced to two years in prison, which is basically a death sentence for an old lady who just wanted to save the lives of unborn children. Uh, okay, but still, Trump holds rallies and talks loudly, so he's like Hitler that way. But uh, what else? Hitler found a, a, it fair to use physical violence to intimidate the opposition. So that would be, and that's Biden too, really, because, uh, you know, he's having these old ladies in prison for protecting babies, but everyone who passed uh, by the Capitol on January 6th has to be hunted down, but the George Floyd rioters, those were fine. In fact, the city of New York just agreed to pay $13 million to hundreds of people who were arrested during the George Floyd, uh, you know, riots. So, so that's more like Biden. He uses violence. So let's, let's violence run free. Uh, the left and Biden lets violence run free to intimidate his opposition. Okay, but but indulging in heavy strains of anti-Semitism, including uh, turning a blind eye to violent attacks on Jewish people, that would that would be Biden. Okay, that's Biden. Uh, what about uh, how about Hitler used this minor incident, uh, the burning of the Reichstag? It wasn't that minor. It was you know burning of the Capitol building, uh, and he used that to crack down on people's rights and take people's rights away. So that would be like Biden in January six, where there was a, actually was a January. 6th and he's been arresting people ever since. Okay, so let's let's play the game that way. And then we see that, in fact, if you want to draw comparisons, you really have to look at Joe Biden and Hitler. Now, here's the thing. I don't think Joe Biden is Hitler. You know, I think if you're going to call somebody Hitler, you got to produce the bodies. you got to produce the wars. A lot more wars started under Biden. No wars started under Trump. So that's another way that Biden's like Hitler. But no, I don't think that Biden is like Hitler. What I do think is that this Netflix show is a perfect metaphor for the American state of communication and the American state of mind because the, the history is accurate. So we can see the history unfolding. We can see that the person who's most like this, who's most following this authoritarian playbook are the Democrats, is Biden. And then we hear the commentary and it's like, it's like the steady gaslighting, right? Because even though we see with our own eyes that the people who lie, the people who silence, the people who arrest the opposition, the people who let violence go unpunished when it's violence on their side, all the Democrats, all the left, all Biden. And then we hear this commentary telling us, oh no, it's it's Trump. It's like Mar-a-Lago. Hitler is, you know, goes on holiday. That's like Mar-a-Lago. Hitler holds rallies and talks in a loud voice. That's like Trump. The narration is never-ending gaslight. And so the state of mind is exactly the same, right? That we see what's happening. We see history unfolding. We see people being arrested on minor crimes. We see the opposition party being arrested, Donald Trump being put on trial for nothing. And yet the press keeps telling us that what we're seeing is not what's happening and what's happening isn't happening. That's the definition of gaslight. That's from that play, famous play, Gaslight, uh, by a, a, a British writer, it was called Angel Street when they put it on here, where a husband is turning down the gas lights in the house and then telling his wife she's not seeing it. That's what's happening. We see this happening, but they're telling us not. This poisons the well of conversation. It makes it impossible for Americans on both sides to debate like adults, to compromise and negotiate like fellow Americans. They're drowning us in lies. They give credence. It gives credence to the worst on the left and the, and the right because now— the people in the middle are alienated from one another. So the people with the on the extremes now have the loudest voices. And it makes the reasonable people sick and tired. All that extremism, all the hatred, all the rage makes reasonable people tired of politics. I keep hearing this. I don't want to go on social media anymore. I don't want to think about politics anymore. I hear this from reasonable, decent people. And who does that leave in control of the field? It leaves the extremists on the left and right, which is what happened in Germany. The problem we are facing right now is not the problem we are facing. Our problems are not the problem. 
The problem is the lying. The problem is the lying of a failed and corrupt elite who demonize the normal men and women of every race and color and creed who may be a little bit on the left, maybe a little bit on the right, maybe even a little further left and right. You know, we have our differences in this country, which is fine. There's a lot of us here, a lot of us here. But when you start to think that there's no Venn diagram, there's no place where the sides can get together and talk, that's the press and academe and Hollywood and the administration, the Democrat administration, demonizing everybody who opposes, who opposes them. And I'll show you as we go forward what I mean. For many people, tossing and turning all night is a frustrating experience. For me, it's just normal. But for you, when sleep seems elusive, it can be both physically and mentally draining. That's why I, I love Beam even though I don't sleep because Beam actually will put you to sleep. It, it even put me to sleep. It's not just your run-of-the-mill sleep aid. It's a concoction carefully crafted to help you slip into sleep without the grogginess that often accompanies other sleep remedies. Beam Dream contains a powerful all-natural blend of reishi, magnesium, L-theanine, apigenin, and melatonin to help you fall asleep, stay asleep, and wake up refreshed. It really does. It tastes good, too. Today, my listeners get a special discount on Beam's Dream Powder, their best-selling hot cocoa for sleep with no added sugar. It's now available in delicious flavors like cinnamon cocoa, chocolate peanut butter, and mint chip. Better sleep has never tasted better. Just mix Beam Dream into hot water or milk, stir or froth, which is my favorite part, using a little frothing machine, and enjoy it before bedtime. If you find yourself battling the bedtime blues, give it a shot. Your tired self will thank you. If you want to try Beam's best-selling Dream Powder, Take advantage of 40% off for a limited time when you go to shopbeam.com slash Clavin and use code Clavin at checkout. That's shopbeam.com slash Clavin with my promo code Clavin for up to 40% off your order. And you're probably saying to yourself, Beam, anyone can spell Beam. How? Please tell me how do you spell Clavin? K-L-A-V-A-N. No E's in Clavin. I just make it look this easy. There are no E's in Clavin. Chapter two, if their lips are moving. So, you know, I started talking, saying we we're going to interview Mel Nellie Bowles on Wednesday, which I'm really looking forward to. I, like I said, I read her book, Morning After the Revolution. And what's so interesting about it is Nellie is a progressive. Uh, she's gay and she believes in universal health care and all these things. And she is working at the New York Times, which is her dream job. This is how it opens with her working at the New York Times. And she starts to realize that wokeness, the woke revolution has started. And they want to stop her from doing her job. And this is her dream job. Now, you know, I'm sure many, many of you know what it's like to have a dream job or to have a dream ambition or whatever it is and to have that come under threat. And she doesn't want to lose her job. She doesn't want to be left out. She doesn't want to be alienated from the people who are on her side. She's a progressive. And, I, you know, I, she still identifies as, as a progressive. And she's now being told that, quote, this is a quote from the book, if you want to be a part of the movement for universal health care, which I did and do, and you cannot report critically on defund the police. If you want to be part of a movement that supports gay marriage, and I did and do, then you can't question whatever disinformation is spread that week. And she talks about the story she covers. Uh, she covers PragerU, you know, great the great videos that come out of PragerU, and they tell her, uh, no, no, this is too nice. You know, this is too nice. You have to report what the Southern Poverty Law Center says about PragerU. Southern Poverty Law Center, which is a hate group on the left, which makes its living calling people on the right hate groups, although I hear they just fired a bunch of their people, which, you know, I'm crying very deeply about that. I just, I just don't show it. I just look happy. That's it. I'm really actually crying a lot. Uh, as she describes her efforts to cover the Antifa and BLM takeovers of part of S Seattle, remember the Chaz zones, uh, and a man she describes as a rising leader in the Times newsroom tells her this, quote, Antifa was nonsense, fake, a nothing burger, a non-story, not interesting, not real. The reason he doesn't go to Seattle, that this guy doesn't go to Seattle and cover things like this is because he knows right now it's time for white people to sit certain things out. Some things that are not important things shouldn't be, shouldn't be covered. This is the New York Times. The Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone, Chaz, and whatever was going on there wasn't important. Antifa wasn't important. 
Why do you care, he says. No, but seriously, why do you care? So here's Nellie, a good reporter, a curious reporter, a progressive reporter, being told if you're not on the right side of history, if you are reporting the truth. Blaming the media for things is so cliched, it's almost boring, and yet they are to blame. He, Donald Trump got them 100% right. They are the enemy of the American process because they are clouding the field with lies. And listen, I think this is falling apart because of social media. I think people are getting more sophisticated. I think people on the left and the right are beginning to being able now to pick out the truth from this flood of information that's coming through social media. But they are working hard to hide the truth from us if it violates these tenets, if it violates the leftist tenets. This week of the Daily Wire, Brent Scherer, uh, S-C-H-E-R, writes about the this horrible shooting that happened a year ago last March in the Christian Covenant School. Remember a deluded transgender girl who thought she was a man murdered six people, including these three beautiful little children. I mean, just an absolutely mindless, uh, horrible, horrible tragedy. And if you remember, Corrine Jean Identity Hire, the spokeswoman for the White House, immediately came out and said, our hearts are with the transgender community because they're really hurting right now. Uh, unbelievable, unbelievable, heartless cruel, twisted, sick thing for her to say. And then the shooter's manifesto vanished. It vanished. And now the, the journal, or at least copies of the journal, have come out. The Daily Wire has some of it exclusively. Uh, and uh, Schur is uh, reporting on this. Brent Schur is reporting on this. Uh, the shooter writes, of course, about, he says, being female was a curse, that she'd kill to have puberty blockers, to have had puberty blockers. Now, I find this thing about blaming movements for mass shootings absolutely disgusting because I think mass shootings are a matter of uh, mental illness and that our mental health system has fallen down. But the transgender movement is a violent movement. Of course it is because it's fighting reality. It, a substantial number of thugs at these Chaz zones were uh were transgender, an abnormal number of the people in the black block with masks on hitting people with sticks were transgender. The Matt Walsh gets death threats constantly. Some of them are from me, but but the rest of them, many of the rest of them are for trans people. And the Democrat thugs support this violence. I mean, this guy, Dr. Ethan Heim, I think his name is pronounced. He was a, a uh, doctor who leaked to Chris Rufo at City Journal that Texas Children's Hospital was doing secret transgender surgeries after they said they were not. He has now been indicted by the gangster AG Merrick Garland uh, at the Department of Justice on four felony counts of violating the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. So passing on this information. Who else has been what other whistleblower gets indicted by the feds for this? So why couldn't we hear about the motives of the Covenant shooter? Well, here's from reading from the Daily Wire article, that blackout appears to be due to a newly reported memo by the FBI in which the Federal Intelligence Agency warned Nashville police that releasing this manifesto could result in quote-unquote false narratives that quote, may lead to unintended consequences for the segment of the population more vulnerable or open to conspiracy theories, which is not Christians, heaven for feds although they are the most persecuted religion on earth. It is the transgender people, the poor transgender people. So to protect the violent transgender movement, we had to make sure that nobody knew that this act of violence was committed by a transgender person because she was transgender. Now, we all know when a right-winger shoots somebody, it's because of the right-wingery. If a left-winger shoots somebody, it's because of guns. It's bad, bad for guns. So whatever happens, it's bad for the right. But how can we discuss it? How can we talk? How can we even talk about gun rights, which seem to the left? I know these liberal people think, oh, you guys are extreme on gun rights. We're just following the Constitution for absolutely good reasons. But how can we discuss it when the truth can't come out because the FBI is intimidating a local police force and the press is not motivated to go around them? The press is not motivated to go around them. Here's another story, just talking about the lies. Chief Justice John Roberts and Justice Sam Alito are at an annual black tie event for the Supreme Court Historical Society, and a, an undercover leftist activist named Lauren Roberts poses as a Catholic conservative and tapes her conversations with the justices. I can't complain about that because I support Project Veritas, sauce for the gander, sauce for the goose. She's undercover. She's doing undercover, um, you know, journalism. It's kind of different in the sense that they own so much of the journalist's territory. Project Veritas is fighting the power, but still, you can't complain. This is what she's doing. 
So what happens? Here's the report from Rolling Stone. Justice Samuel Alito spoke candidly about the ideological battle between the left and the right, discussing the difficulty of living, quote unquote, peacefully with ideological opponents in the face of, quote, fundamental differences that can't be compromised. He endorsed was his interlocutor described as a necessary fight to return our country to a place of godliness. <laughs> they make Alito sound like, you know, Torquemada. He's <laughs> like some lunatic Catholic who wants to, you know, fight to bring this back. Here's the Times reporting the same thing. Justice Samuel Alito told a woman posing as a Catholic conservative that compromise in America between the left and the right might be impossible. The justice's comments appeared to be in marked contrast to those of Chief Justice Roberts, who was also recorded, but said the court couldn't do anything about it. Well, let's hear this tape. Let's listen to this tape from Lauren Roberts. What I'm going to play you, part of what I play you was in these articles. This is where he says he agrees with Lauren Roberts that the religious divide is great and some th things can't be compromised. This is cut six. One side or the other is going to win. Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, there can be... A, 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 uh, a, a way of working, a way of living together peacefully, but it's difficult, you know, because there are differences on fundamental things that really can't be compromised. You know, really can't be compromised. So it's not like we're going to split the difference. And, and that's what I'm saying. I just, I think that the solution really is like winning the moral argument. Like, people in this country who believe in God have got to keep fighting for that to return our country to a place of, of godliness. Oh, I agree with you. All right, so I agree with you. People uh, who believe in God have got to return, keep fighting to return this country to a place of godliness. Alito is a Catholic. He agrees with her. I agree with her. I think anybody who thinks about it agrees with her and that there are things like abortion that you can't really compromise on. You know, you may have to politically, but morally, you can't compromise on abortion. That's the quote that was repeated in both the Times story and the Rolling Stone story. Here's a quote not mentioned in either story. I, I do not I know it wasn't in the Stone story. I don't think it was in the Times story. The lady tries to get Alito to say, well, the court has to do something about this, has to take sides. Listen to his response. I support your ruling on dogs. I support, like, I am very pro-life, but like, you know, I don't know how we bridge that gap. You know, like, how do we get people... Squeeze I wish I knew. I wish I knew. I don't know. It's not... I don't think it's something we can do. But the court can't do anything. So. I mean, we have a very defined role. Yeah. We need to do what we're supposed to do. But this is a bigger problem. This is way above us. So I wish I knew the answer. I do. So as a Catholic man, he wants the country to be more godly. As a judge, he says, there's nothing we can do. We have to just do our job, which is exactly what Antonin Scalia used to say. He was, used to say the role of a good Christian judge is to follow the law. That is what you do. That's my job. That's what I do. That was not quoted in these stories because they're lying to you. They want to make it sound like he's an extremist, like he's Torquemada. And the thing is, Look, I'm sure you know good people who are atheists, you know, people of sincerity who are atheists. I know many people who are atheists and who are friends. We talk about it. We can discuss it. We can go back and forth and debate it. But how can we when the people who take the news from the New York Times, like every juror who is in the Trump trial— they believe this is the case. They believe, How can they not? That's where they're getting their news. They're getting their news from the New York Times. And this is what they believe, that this justice is going to take away their right to be atheists or to believe freely or worship freely because he's Torquemada. Now, uh, the, the lies just pile up and they pile up and they poison everything. And the thing is, if they poison our hearts, then we have no way of reaching out. We're going to look. It's a democracy. It's a republic. We live in a big place where people are going to disagree. That's life. We've got to be able to reach out to the guy next to us who disagrees and talk and discuss things. But how can you when you cannot get through the disinformation? Here's one more from the New York Times. Hunter Biden, obviously convicted on these gun things, these gun charges. 
Hunter Biden conviction undercuts a Trump narrative and a fundraising pitch. Only only the New York Times could find something bad for Trump in the conviction of Hunter Biden, which has does nothing for Trump one way or the other. Many Trump allies have been secretly rooting for an acquittal. The talking points wrote themselves. It would have been yet more evidence that the United States justice system was rigged in favor of the Bidens and against the Trumps. Tuesday's guilty verdict was inconvenient to that narrative. Unbelievable. Un- that's an unbelievable statement. But just to hear it come from PBS, because you know, you're funding, you're paying for PBS. Here's Laura Baron Lopez explaining just how bad conservatives are and how wonderful and decent Democrats are. This is the news from PBS, which you're paying for. Clip eight. Campaign spokesperson for President Trump issued a statement saying, quote, this trial has been nothing more than a distraction from the real crimes of the Biden crime family. Biden's reign over the Biden family criminal empire is all coming to an end on November 5th. Again, repeating baseless accusations against President Biden, claiming that he was involved in his son's business dealings uh, overseas, which there has been no evidence to support those claims uh, from President from former President Trump, as well as other Republicans. It's important to note, Omna, the difference between the way Republicans reacted to the verdict in Trump's New York case versus the way Democrats have reacted to the Hunter Biden verdict. And that's that Republicans called the system rigged when the verdict came down and said that uh, they ultimately thought that there was a conspiracy theory. Democrats, by comparison, have said that the judicial process needs to be respected. Not distorted at all, right? Really, really just straight on news, news direct from your publicly funded PBS NewsHour. Just lies. Those are lies. There is no comparison. The judge in the Hunter Biden case, U.S. District Judge Mary Ellen, Mary Ellen Noreka, is a no-nonsense Trump appointee. She was the one who blew up the DOJ's dirty deal that they made with Hunter Biden that was supposed to get him immunity on especially uh, get him no jail time on the gun charges and get him immunity on the tax charges, which do, in fact, implicate the Biden family. Uh, on the other hand, in the uh, and she blew that up. She ran a good trial. She ran a fair trial. David Weiss let the statute of limitations lapse on the tax offenses, where the statute of limitations on sex crimes was repealed in New York to allow Trump to be accused of raping Jean Carroll. The most important part of the Hunter Biden trial was the fact that the DOJ admitted the laptop was real. So all of this stuff saying that was Russian disinformation or that it was not real or that it wasn't proved, all of that, we saw that on 60 Minutes, all of that was lies. The depth of the media's dishonesty, the judge in the New York case was obviously a dirty job, bent judge who was given every Trump case, which can't possibly happen. It makes it impossible for us to talk. And I, we, we're going to have to talk. We do not want this country torn to shreds. We do not want this country, you know, people at each other's throats. And that is the situation we're in. And we're not in that situation because of the people of America. We're in the situation because of the information directors of America and the administration that works with them. And now the police department, the FBI and the DOJ who've gone dirty, who are working with them as well. We are absolutely drowning in lies. Let's talk about the perfect gene. Before I found the perfect gene, people would look at me and say, God, that guy is so incredibly good looking. He's so sexually vibrant. And yet, you know, he needs to master those gene, that gene look. He needs genes that offer unparalleled comfort without compromising on style or functionality. The perfect gene offers waist sizes from 26 to 50 and lengths from 26 to 38. They perfectly fit your body and accentuate your beautiful. I mean, look at this. This this is the form, a kind of form that they will accentuate. It, this doesn't just come naturally. You have to be first blessed with it, and then you have to wear the perfect gene because it doesn't stop there. They've revolutionized t-shirts as well. Their perfect tee is as soft as butter and doesn't shrink in the wash like your other tees. Stop wearing stiff and uncomfortable jeans. Go to theperfectgene.nyc right now. My listeners can use code CLAVEN15 at checkout to get 15% off their first order, plus free shipping, free returns, and free exchanges. Get 15% off at theperfectgene.nyc with promo code CLAVEN15. And after you purchase, tell them you found them at the Andrew Claven Show. That, tell them that that's why that guy looks so great, and I knew that's why I needed the perfect gene. That's theperfectgene.nyc with promo code Clavin 15.
Chapter three, they're not evil because they lie. Now, I just I want to touch on this just briefly. This is the hostage rescue in Israel. And I'm completely, I don't even see a gray area in this. I mean, Israel was attacked. There was a ceasefire between them and the terrorists of Hamas. There was a brutal, horrible, evil attack and hostages were taken. They go in and they free the hostages, four hostages they find in an amazing raid that almost went awry. Here's just an example. Here's the Washington Post headline, and this was not an isolated headline. More than 200 Palestinians killed in Israeli hostage raid in Gaza. The brazen daytime raid freed four Israeli hostages, but unleashed relentless bombardment of the Nuzerat refugee camp in central Gaza. Now, just to drive this home, here is the BBC interviewing, this is unbelievable, interviewing Jonathan Conricus from a pro-Israeli think tank. It's cut nine. It is appearing to be a high civilian death toll. Would there have been a warning to those civilians for them to get out on time? For sure, of course, we cannot anticipate Israel to be warning ahead of a raid to extract or to save hostages, because then what the terrorists would do is to uh, kill the hostages, and that would defeat the purpose. So, of course, we cannot expect that. <laughs> so he just, if, you, if you can see his face, if you're not just listening, the look on his face is like he's just fighting back the words, you stupid bimbo, you know? <laughs> it's, like, it's like the bimbo is silent in this. This is an amazing, amazing ideological evil. And I've talked about this before, how people who, who have a conscience can be talked out of their conscience by ideology, this decolonization ideology, which is a complete nonsense in the case of Israel because, of course, Israel is an indigenous people. It's also, you want to talk about Hitler in comparisons to Hitler, that was Hitler's ideology, is decolonize Germany and let the Aryan people, the indigenous Aryan people and the indigenous Aryan culture rise to the top. This is the same thing that they're arguing here, that it doesn't matter. One of these four hostages was the 26-year-old girl, Noah Ar Argamani, who was carried off, you'll remember, in one of just a heartbreaking, heartbreaking piece of video, carried off on a motorcycle, screaming for her life, reaching out to people, screaming, "Don't let them kill me! Don't let them kill me!" She was a China-born uh, Israeli. She was rescued amazingly from this. And what does it turn out? It turned out that the, these hostages were being held by civilians, passed from civilian to civilian. The, all the civilians knew she was there. She said when she got there, she was afraid of being lynched by the civilians. There's a very, very thin line in Gaza between the civilians and the terrorists. They voted the terrorists in. Now the terrorists won't leave. It's true, but still. And Hamas chief Yahya Sinwar, according to the Wall Street Journal, has been telling people, well, we have Israel exactly where we want them. The more innocent or civilian lives that are lost, the more civilians that are killed, the better for us, because it means people will turn against Israel. So this murder is playing into the hands of the useful idiots who have been bought into this decolonization narrative. And let's, let, let's be blunt about this, because anti-Semitism, I, I know that Jews don't like to they don't like to feel special because they feel that makes them a target. I've said this before. Anti-Semitism is the hatred of God. That's all it is. I mean, it really is. It's the hatred of God. And it's the hatred of Jesus Christ, by the way, because it's that's how the, the, the true God got into Gentile cultures through Jesus Christ. But it's the same God that Abraham worshipped, same God that Isaac and Jacob worshipped. It's That's the God of the Jews has become everybody in the West God through Jesus Christ. So it's a hatred of that that turns people and makes people so vicious against God. Jews. And let's not forget when the Jews went into Argentina and arrested the architect, one of the main architects of the Holocaust, Adolf Eichmann, they were condemned by everybody, including the United States, for violating Argentina's space, right? When they bombed Iraq's nuclear facilities, I had a guy from the State Department tell me that was a, a violation of international law. And I said, you know what? I never lost a minute's sleep about a violation of an international law that doesn't exist. They, they were attacked when they fought back in the Yom Kippur War. They were attacked when they fought back on the Six-Day War. The world is simply much more comfortable with Jews in mass graves than with Jews in arms. They, the Jews are resolutely hated. And the argument from the anti-Semites is, well, 
there must be something wrong with them because we keep treating them so badly. You know? It's like, no, I, eh, you want to rethink that a little bit. If you're acting like an SOB, it may be because you're an SOB, right? And it's not, of course, everybody who treats the Jews badly, but it is everybody in power because they hate the God who says that power isn't everything. The thing is, this ideology, I, I know a lot of people on the left who are not evil, but this ideology leads to evil because it's false. It is a lie. And the thing is, once you become evil, you got to stick to that lie because otherwise the mirror opens up in front of you and you see yourself. The thing is, this chapter was called They're Not Evil Because They Lie. They lie because their ideology has made them evil and they can't face it. And it's those lies, and I've been, I've been saying this for as long as I've been commentating on world events, it's those lies that are the enemy because once you start lying and once you start clouding the field with lies, there's simply no way back for you from the evil that you've gotten yourself into, the things you've committed that you can't acknowledge, the guilt and shame that you feel. And so they want to poison the rest of us with those lies and they're working at it really hard. Men, have you heard of Roe Sparks? This dual action prescription merges the powerhouse ingredients found in generic Viagra and Cialis, sildenafil and tadalafil into one formidable treatment. But it's not merely about the ingredients in the medication, it's how you're taking it. That's why Roe Sparks are designed to dissolve under your tongue. That's huge because dissolvable treatment hits your bloodstream faster than old school pills. Roe Sparks keeps you present with your partner instead of waiting for a pill to work. Roe Sparks leverages the benefits of sublingual administration, meaning the tablet dissolves under your tongue. This method allows for fast absorption directly into the bloodstream, bypassing the digestive system. The result, quicker onset of action, reducing the wait time typically associated with traditional pills. Plus, Tadalafil, the active ingredient in Cialis, lasts in the system for up to 36 hours. So when the mood is right, you'll be ready without another dose. For treatment that works fast and lasts long, connect with a provider at ro.co slash Clavin to find out if Row Sparks are right for you. ro.co slash Clavin. Again, that's ro.co slash Clavin, which is K-L-A-V-A-N. Compounded drugs are permitted to be prescribed under federal law, but are not FDA approved and do not undergo FDA safety effectiveness or manufacturing review, only available if prescribed after an online consultation with a provider. Final chapter, The Sin of Queens. So one of the many, many things, many, many, many things I will never forgive Michael Knowles for is that he told the story in his book about him and me, but he didn't name me. And I, he, I said to him, Why, how could you say this, tell the story without giving me credit? He said, he didn't want to get me in trouble. <laughs> he obviously isn't listening to the show. Or he would know that I'm always in trouble. But Knowles was talking, we were talking, this is a long, long time ago when we were back in LA. Knowles was a guest on the show because I was trying to give him some kind of career because the guy, he was living on the street. He was, it was, it was disgusting. And so I brought him on the show and he was talking about Pride Month. He was talking about the fact as, as a Catholic that he knows that pride used to be, he said, pride used to be called the queen of sins. And I immediately said, well, now it's the sin of queens, <laughs> which I think is pretty good. And I want to talk about why I, I believe that gay people can be included in society and should not be condemned for their private lives and should live their private lives in peace, but why I think Pride Month is such an ugly and stupid thing. So let's go back to this Netflix documentary on Hitler, the Evil on Trial, and it's called that because it's, a lot of it takes place in the Nuremberg Trials. Listen to what they say about the Weimar Republic. Now, just for those of you who haven't studied this, the Weimar Republic was the shaky, after World War I, when Ger the Germans lost World War I, they were just decimated. They, they, didn't, they thought they were winning. All the press was lying to them and telling them they were winning, and suddenly it was over. And this is why many people said, well, it's the Jews' fault. You know, so it must be the Jews' fault. No, they had been beaten in the field by the Allies, and they just weren't being told about it, and they just developed this conspiracy theory about it. So the Weimar Republic was this shaky liberal democracy out of Weimar. It's, if you've ever seen the movie Cabaret, that's about the Weimar Republic. And it is what fell when Hitler came in and took power. So listen to what the historians here are saying about the Weimar Republic. This is cut three. Between 1924 and 1929, this period is kind of often described as the golden age of the Weimar Republic. The good life 
Sip's interview, even if it isn't quite reachable for the majority of people. The Weimar Republic was a progressive, liberal democracy. We have relative political stability. We also have a thriving cultural sphere. Filmmakers, cabaret. We think about abstract and expressionist artists, the Bauhaus architectural movement. Germany was becoming more accepted in the international arena, so she wasn't a pariah anymore. And so there's this kind of quite liberating and modernizing aspect to the 1920s. <laughs> so you, you may have missed that one little line in there. It's not quite reachable for the majority of people. So in one city, in urban areas, Bauhaus architecture, the ugliest architecture that has ever been invented. Expressionist art, the ugliest art that has ever been invented. No, not on film. German expressionism on film was pretty good, but the painting was incredibly ugly. But this is what they're celebrating, even though millions and millions of people are out of work and the economy is a mess, okay? Now listen to them go on. This is cut four. Women were able to vote for the first time. There are sex reform movements with individuals like Magnus Hirschfeld, who did studies about homosexuality and was conducting some of the first transgender surgeries in the Weimar Republic. And so you see all of this dynamism emerging. But on the other hand, the Nazi party, Hitler in particular, recognizes that there are so many German citizens that are distrustful of this fledgling democracy that is supposed to be this new beacon of, of hope, but it rather is a beacon of disillusionment for many. Because they're starving, because they're out of work. The pictures, you, if you're just listening, the pictures of people like eating like gruel out of bowls, and people are starving out of work. So this small, corrupt, decadent elite is thrilled that they're doing transgender surgeries and celebrating homosexuality. I just wonder, it's liberating. It's one, oh my goodness, and the, and the Bauhaus, are, oh my goodness. You know, when Hitler came to power, and they mentioned this in, this in the documentary, the women loved him. They loved him. And one of the women says, well, it wasn't sexual. No, it, it wasn't sexual. It was because he put motherhood above all things. And, you know, Hitler was a deeply evil man. He was a psychopath. He was, he was a, a demon. I mean, a de if, a, if a demon wasn't living in that man, there are no such thing as demons. But just like the left peddles the evils of racism in the guise of tolerance, right, in the guise of equality, they public, they, they peddle it by using good things. Hitler sold his evil by hiding it behind good things, things that were neglected by the elites, values that were transgressed by a small level, small number of elites who were living decent lives, wealthy lives, who had the money that they needed, who had the things that they needed because they were decadent and didn't care. Decadence always serves the elites. If, you're, if there's decadence, you can abuse women. If there's decadence, you can get laid. If there's decadence and you're a gay guy, you can have gay sex. But the people were starving and their normal moral values were being transgressed and they opened the door to this monster Hitler. Hitler was the monster, but the left, you know, there's a reason they call far right wing conservatives reactionary. It's because they react. They react to something. What they react to is the decadence and the wickedness and the selfishness and the power-hungry uh, indifference to poverty on the left, which is what we're seeing in America today. There was a Pew poll that came out. Is society better off if people marry and make having children a priority? The percentage answering yes, all voters, uh, 39%. Less than half of voters say, is society better off if people marry and make having children a priority? Imagine that. Trump voters, 59%, 60% say yes. Biden voters, 19%. Whites say 41%, and then all the minorities, less than that. So let's talk about the lies that now surround sexuality. Because you know what? 
I'm, I'm, I'm a libertarian when it comes to, I don't want to know what people are doing behind doors. I don't think about it. I, you know, I'm, I'm like Ebenezer Scrooge who said, it's enough for a man to mind his own business. Mine occupies me constantly. My sex thoughts, my sex life, they occupy me constantly. I don't care what you're doing. Have a good time. However, simple common sense. Sex has a telos. Everything has a telos, a purpose, a reason for being. That purpose is having children. That's the reason we have, if you believe in evolution, if you believe in evolution, even only within a species, it comes about for a reason. It comes about because it is the way that people are moved to have children. Heteronormativity, which the left condemns, is normativity. It is normal. And marriage is the best way we've ever found of dealing with it. Why? Because it makes the people who create the children responsible for the children. It makes the people who love the children responsible for the children. The government doesn't love your children. The government doesn't care about your children. The government doesn't know your children's names. They are not the ones who should be responsible for your children. You should be, and you are, if you are married, if that marriage matters, if society holds that marriage up. That is the reason that societies that do well, Victorian England, 50s America, maximize the family, actually prioritize the family. And if we don't, evil ensues. And you know, this is another lie. Abortion kills close to a million unborn children in the U.S. every year, okay? I think it's between 800,000 and a million. And I understand there's tragedy involved in unwanted pregnancies. I understand that, you know, women want to be free, I, all that. But what argument, what argument plausibly strips a baby of its humanity, right? The argument now is, I have a right to choose. How does that strip a baby of its humanity? Or I want to be a rock star. I have a career. How does that strip a baby of his humanity? I don't want this baby. I'm in trouble. I've been raped. All of those things. Very sad. Really terrible. How does it strip a baby of its humanity? How does it stop it? Abortion from being homicide. It, you know, they're all things worth talking about. And it's not that women who are pregnant and don't want to be should be condemned or hurt or anything like that. But none of it strips a baby of his humanity. And once you see that, once you understand it, once you understand that there is no argument that strips that baby of its humanity, except for this, you're the only one who can talk. You have all the power. You're the one who is, is present and in the room. And that baby is helpless and silent and cut off from mercy. Once you understand that, then you see, you know what? If you don't prioritize marriage and the family, if you don't prioritize babies and the natural job of creation, if you prioritize sexual freedom, if you prior, prioritize the pride, the wonderful, wonderful pride of being homosexual, you, you create evil in a society. Now, here's the thing. Just, let's talk reality instead of like, you know, slogans. A lot of people in the world, a lot of people in this country, some of them are gay. Some of them are just weird. You know, never mind gay. Some of them have weird things that they do. I believe in weirdos. I do. I'm an artist. I, I believe in weirdos. I believe there should be room in a society for weirdos, eccentrics, people that everybody looks down their noses upon, people who are, you know, shunned, all of that. I think that they're important. They're cultural critical. They're frequently uh, produce wonderful uh, arts and, uh, you know, have a function of an intelligentsia that actually uh, brings in things that that we might get complacent about. If you don't have people with doubt, you can't have faith. If you don't have people with criticism, you can't have a culture that grows and, and uh, expands. I have worked with many, many, I'm in the arts. I've lived my life in the arts. I've worked with many, many gay people I have, whom I have loved and respected and befriended. And, you know, if you want to believe they're sinful and tell, tell them they're sinful or believe it and don't tell them, uh, you know, again, if, that, if you do that respectfully and that's your philosophy, I have no problem. Personally, I believe if God doesn't have a sense of humor about our sexuality, we are all well and truly screwed, all right? Because all of us are bent, you know, in some way or other. All of us are. Just the fact that we can't, you know, I, I mean, I, I adore my wife. I've had 45 years of the happiest marriage on earth. But, you know, are you going to ask me, have I ever attracted, if I ever lust after women in my heart? No, never, never. Never happens. Never happens. All of us are bent sexually. All I'm saying is that gay people are in the position of black people. If, if you're white and you're a race that people don't like, like Italian or Irish or Jewish, you can hide that. But if you're black, you're black. Everybody can see it. If you're gay, you're gay. Everybody can see it. But all of us are bent. So I think a little tolerance, a little kindness, a little mercy, a little love, as the Bible tells us, covers the multitude of sins. That's what it says. Charity covers the multitude of sins. I know it's often translated as a multitude of sins, but I checked this with my son, the linguist, who says it really is a 
better translation that says it covers the multitude of sins. A sane society is heteronormative and marriage-friendly with tolerance and love for the oddballs and the gay people and all that stuff. But to say that the abnormal supersedes the normal, to say that the abnormal is the privileged class, that and to, and to bring that to children and teach it to children before they've even had a chance to learn what the, what nature, where nature will take them normally, where nature takes normally, that is to corrupt the soul of the society. This Pride Month, it has to be a month because the shame is so great, a week or a day won't cover it. To spread this through children, it is fostering evil. And it's not the problem of individual gay people who should be loved and cherished for what they do in society and ignored, for, you know, and left alone like the rest of us for what they do personally or in their imagination or wherever they do it. It's none of our business. Even, even if you condemn it, you know, it's between them and God still. But still, to prioritize that, to prioritize that is, is to lead to evil. You know, the last place I, we stopped my wife and I stopped in our hike through Germany. It was a little beautiful, beautiful medieval town called Freiburg, which also is in Werewolf Cop. And, and there's a beautiful cathedral there, and in the it's dedicated to the Virgin Mary. And in the tympanum, the place that's over the entranceway, that kind of arc that's over the entranceway, there are all these sculptures. And one of the sculptures was the Virgin Mary being thrown, crowned, sitting on a throne in heaven, being crowned by the Father and by the Son. Now, this is an image. I don't think there are thrones and crowns in heaven, and I don't think she's sitting there, you know, being having a crown. But it tells you what we're supposed to be and what we're supposed to mean to one another. What a woman is supposed to be in a society. It tells us how elevated that position is, how elevated that position of mother is. And if the good people, if the straight people, if the people who love one another and care about freedom and care about this country, don't promote that and don't say, look, this is what a woman is. It's not some guy in a dress on a beer can. It is something that is actually reflects, that actually reflects something in the heavenly world, something in the world beyond this world that is of value, of infinite preciousness. If they don't do it, then the bad guys come along and do it just like Hitler did, and the women will follow them because they it's true, because it's true. That, that is what they reflect. That is what they're born to do. It is what makes them the, the center of every society. So many good and valuable people are, are gay, and they are, should be left to work out their own salvation in fear and trembling, just like every single other person. But when it comes to Pride Month, we should be ashamed. This is to elevate the abnormal, to elevate the outsider is to leave the normal people, the majority of people, the productive people, the people who are imitating God by creating life. It's to leave them in the lurch and leave them prey to the worst forces in society. We should be ashamed of our pride. All right, parents, let's have a talk. Life is chaotic. Sometimes you need a break. Enter Bent Key, the Daily Wire's fantastic new kids entertainment app. Ben Key brings you top-notch shows like Chip Chilla. Both seasons are ready to stream. Plus, we've got kid crowd pleasers like Super Tato and Gus Plus Us. And here's the best part. We're reviving the magic of Saturday morning cartoons with new episodes every week. Your kids will get to feel the same thrill you did back in the day. This isn't just about keeping the little ones busy. It's about giving you some peace of mind. Ben Key offers safe, engaging and educational content that lets you catch your breath without worry. Here's a great deal. You can get all this amazing content free for 14 days. Just use the code UNLOCK at checkout on bentkey.com and start your free trial today. Let BentKey help you create those special moments for your kids while you take a well-earned break. Unlock the adventure now at bentkey.com. Clavin Clapbacks. Oh, Earth Rider, thanks for the Great Lakes. I wonder why it's coming. <laughs> yeah, we'll talk about that member block a little bit. Hey, before we get to the uh, clapback, if we have time, I just want to say goodbye to Danny D'Amico, who has been our producer here uh, throughout. It's been, I don't know, how long has it been? It, just, it seems like centuries because the guy's such a bore, but like he has done a great job in bringing the show along. It's been a year since we changed the format. I think it has made the show 10 times better. And Danny's been a big, big part of that. And I'm sure I look forward to seeing him on the street, uh, you know, coming up to me and saying, hey, mister, I used to be the producer on the Andrew Clavin show. Can you loan me a couple of bucks? And I think he's going to do great. No, he's going to go on and do his own thing. And we welcome uh, Tom Stewart as our new producer. And uh, we're going to miss Danny. I, I actually am. I hate to I hate to admit it, but I actually am. All right. Um, 
Phil Bridges uh, writes in, he says, you keep talking about the end of the country as though it would be a bad thing. I'm not so sure. I think that a national divorce in which the federal government is dissolved and each state gets to govern itself as it sees fit is the necessary and logical conclusion to an impasse, which, let's be honest, is just going to keep getting worse and worse. I am not. I don't think that's guaranteed. Things really do turn around. But my big problem with that, you know, I think the federalism should be emphasized and the states should remain free and different and uh, that we should stop the government from controlling them as much as they do. Do, but if California is attacked by the Chinese, uh, will Arkansas defend them? I mean, will you want to defend them? And if a conservative state, Florida, is attacked, will New York or California want to defend them? And if they don't defend them, what's going to stop the invader from taking over one state after another? That's why we originally hung together, because if we don't hang together, we hang separately. And so I'm not sure that's going to work in, a, in the real live world where things are getting very, very dangerous day, day by day. Um, Colin says, I'm in my mid-30s and trying to find a relationship like the one you and your wife have. <laughs> well, good luck. I know that takes a lot of work. Over the past few dates that I've had, I've been asked two very specific questions about gay rights and abortion rights. And I've had to answer, honestly, as you can imagine, I am most of the time politely let down and sometimes told what an awful person I am for holding my beliefs. Do you believe that those two opinions should be deal breakers for a couple? Thank you for your sage wisdom. I think that uh, anybody who believes that those opinions are deal breakers, that's a deal breaker. You should not be dealing with people who uh, who question your opinions on these things and then basically tell you to get lost. But the most important thing is you should be who you are. You should believe who you are. And you should find a woman who is willing to at least respect that and hopefully be aligned with some of your more important views. So you're not, you know, this. you, you sound a little desperate, I guess I should say, you know, and not to be unkind, but you sound a little desperate, like I'm willing to change my opinions if I can just get a date. Uh, that's not the way these things work. Uh, you know, I, I ju just having spent um, a, a week, more than a week in the woods with my wife, we were both impressed with the fact that, uh, you know, our marriage is not an achievement. It's a gift. We were blessed. Uh, and, uh, or I was blessed, you know, I'm not sure what happened to her, but you know, you can't win them all. Uh, but, but still, uh, you know, you, you certainly cannot go to people and pretend to be, if, if you have to pretend to be something other than you are to get a date or the affection of somebody, you're with the wrong person. And so maybe you should be thinking about how it is that every single girl you go out with is on that side of the fence and willing to, to dump you over that. That would be my answer to that. You're looking, obviously looking in the wrong places. We're going into members block, which means the rest of you will be left behind. Like remember in that novel, those novels where the guys were taken off the earth and the, in the rapture and the rest were left behind. That's what's happening now. We are rapturously going into member block where the rest of you will be left behind. So become a member today. Go to dailywire.com slash subscribe and use code Claven at checkout for two months free on all annual plans. Let me tell you again, while you are here, before you were plunged into Clavenless Darkness, it is wonderful to be back. Uh, I didn't miss you at all, but I'm glad to see <laughs> I'm glad to see you now that I'm here. And on we go into convention season and the real political season begins. Become a member. Go to dailywire.com slash subscribe and use code Claven at checkout.